you are now experiencing the, 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 the Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. Hey everybody, welcome to the Digital Life. On today's show, I talk all things branding with Emily De La Cruz from thebrandingmuse.com. A digital marketing expert from the millennial generation, Emily has carved out a major niche as a digital influencer in New York City as she advises companies and individuals how to properly use branding for business and for life. Also during our conversation, we also talk about networking tips, how to give an elevator pitch, Emily's love for Regina TV, Beyonce as a brand, and best places to eat in New York City. I had a great time talking to Emily De La Cruz. You know, hold on for a second. I love saying her name, Emily De La Cruz. Emily De La Cruz. It just rolls off the tongue. I just love saying her name so much. So without further ado, here's my conversation with the very engaging Emily De La Cruz. Okay, we're talking to branding entrepreneur Emily De La Cruz. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm so excited to be joining you. Well, I'm excited to talk to you. So before we get into branding, you are an unabashed Drake fan, correct? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. <laughs> yes. I would like to get your take on this, well, supposed beef between Drake and Meek Mill, which seemed like it was going to be something great, and then it just kind of fizzled out. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I'm always here for being able to challenge one another. So, I mean, it got Drake to put out a couple more songs. It got Meek on his toes. So, I mean, it's great for hip-hop, honestly. Drake is just putting out hit after hit after hit, and it's definitely getting me through work day. So, I'm excited. The more beats, the better, honestly. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm a little bit older than you because I recently saw Straight Outta Compton. And it reminded me about the beef that NWA had with Ice Cube, which brings us to the branding side of things. And you said, which I totally agree, whoever came up with the straight out of somewhere meme generator needs to get a bonus or needs to get a raise or be named president someplace because that's like one of the best branding <laughs> things I've seen in a long time. Yeah, absolutely. I think especially for me that I also work in marketing, our goal as marketers is always to get something to go right, viral, right, to always be able to kind of spread the message and increase brand awareness and things like that. And I think the straight out of summer campaigns did that so well. It, one, allowed you to connect with that feeling of nostalgia, right, because a lot of times you're not from your hometown, so you can, like, rep on social media. But then it was just a very easily shareable campaign. Um, you know, I was on Instagram, and literally, like, every other picture was a straight out of somewhere, um, me, so I was just like, wow, this is awesome. I'm sure that the person who thought of it probably thought, like, oh, this is going to be cool, you know, some some little added bonus um, to get some buzz, but I don't think that they really thought that it would be what it was. Um, and what it, it continues to be because the movie has just done so well that it's just continued to kind of push that campaign forward. So, yeah, they definitely need a raise. I would love to meet whoever it was that came up with the idea. It was awesome. Right. So I'm working on an ebook, and the last minute I'll put it in there. Because something like this could have totally backfired. Because mm -hmm. so the idea was you rip your city, and then everyone basically took it and made a comedy memes out of it, which could have mm -hmm. just really killed the whole campaign, but it actually heightened the, the sensation of the movie. Yeah, for sure. I think of the Meek Mill and Drake beef. I saw one with Meek Mill that it was like straight out of bars or like straight out of beef. Yeah. So yeah, people, it definitely went last real quick because we all know black Twitter is all about the comedy. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely still served its purpose. So that was good. So, okay, so you didn't work on the campaign, but take me in the room as a branding person. You're sitting in a room, everybody's coming up with ideas. What's the process like when you're just pitching out ideas and finally deciding, okay, this is what we're going to go as far as a brand? Yeah, so, I mean, you have to take into consideration a couple of things, right? First is always resources. How much money do we have to put into this and how much time and people do we have to put into this, right? Because I'm sure, for example, like the Shared Our Summer campaign, Someone needed to co be able to code the technology for you to be able to create the graphics, right? Then you needed marketing people to actually put it out and get the word out that it was happening and things like that. So first, you always have to be realistic about what your resources are before you put out any campaign in general. And then you kind of, you know, backtrack and think, okay, what's the best way to make that emotional connection with our audience to whatever our brand or product is? And then go from there, right? So Straight Outta Compton is obviously about where you're from and rubbing your hood and, and kind of like the, the history um, of a culture. So, you know, the Straight Outta Summer campaign was very much on brand. But thinking about, you know, what are our brand values? What is it that we want to communicate? What do we want people to feel? 
when they participate in the campaign or when they engage with us, whether it's on social or offline or anywhere else that they that might be. So those are just some things that you have to definitely keep in mind, uh, regardless of the idea, right? There's tons of ideas that are going to be great ideas, but if they're not tied back to your values, they're not tied back to your audience, and you don't have the resources to actually execute them, then you're really not going to get too far. So let's talk about you for a second. From what I read, you really started your branded career in college. This thing started to pop up for you mm-hmm. and during that time. But let's go before college. Were you always like a marketing type person when you were growing up? And you'd say, well, I've always been this type of person. Or was it something you kind of stumbled upon and say, hey, I think I'm kind of good at this. Let me give this a shot. Yeah, it was a little bit of both. Um, I mean, I've always loved English. Like, English has always been, you know, my favorite subject. So I knew that I wanted to do something within communications. And I remember when I was um, about to graduate from middle school, for the middle school yearbook, we had to put, you know, when I grow up, you know, I want to be whatever. Um, And I did, like, a lot of research because, of course, me being who I am, I had to, like, take this very seriously because this has been, like, this forever in this random yearbook from 2004, maybe. And I came across public relations practitioner, and I'm like, that's it. I'm going to be a PR person, and it's going to be awesome. And, you know, I'm going to have this fabulous career. At that time, I thought I wanted to work in fashion PR. Um, So I was just kind of always working towards that goal. And quickly realized after a couple of internships that public relations wasn't for me. I was more interested in the digital side of media, in creating the content, in social media, and that type of thing. So it was something I kind of fell into through my internship experiences and something that I definitely um, I'm so grateful for because I cannot imagine my life um, sitting around trying to, you know, network with uh, reporters and write press releases and do all the things that I thought I wanted to do, you know, six, seven years ago. And what I read, and this might be true, I'm not sure, but it was really interesting. You had moved to D.C., and mm-hmm. you had a job down there, and your family moved mm-hmm. you down there. But you realized mm-hmm. you weren't happy, and you went back to New York. Now, some people mm-hmm. might say, you know, I'm going to stick it out to D.C., it'll get better. But you felt like this is not me, and I need to go back where I'm from. Mm-hmm. I'm a typical millennial in the sense of I'm impatient, um, and I just go, go, go. So, yeah, I actually moved down to D.C. Um, after graduation. I thought, I was, like I said, I thought I was going to have this fabulous life and career, and, you know, the real world hit me very quickly. Um, and I realized that I wasn't, you know, a, a D.C. girl, right? D.C. is really focused around um, politics and policy and education and nonprofit um, and consulting, and those weren't the industries that I was very interested in. And I knew I wanted, you know, to still continue to live the entrepreneurial lifestyle, but be able to work full time for someone else because I think that in order for you to be a successful entrepreneur, you do need to get as much experience as you can from other people. So I knew that, you know, the tech scene was in New York. So I decided, you know, to kind of pack my bags once my beach was up and move back to New York and kind of figure it out from there. But it was a blessing in disguise because I was able to grow my business quite a lot while I was um, looking for another full-time gig and ended up, you know, getting uh, some pretty decent contracts in the meantime. So I definitely learned both about, you know, following your passion, but also around just being an entrepreneur and bootstrapping and kind of just figuring it out as you go along. You know, I really feel that everything that you need and all of that advice that you hear is kind of within you. It's kind of this intrinsic thing that you are going to always carry with you, and it just takes certain experiences and certain people to bring it out. What do you look for when you put together your team, for either for branding team or just for your own company? Yeah, so obviously the first thing is who is better at something than me, right? Um, because we all aren't experts in every field, and as entrepreneurs and as professionals, we need to be very realistic around what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are. So the first thing I always look for is experts in other areas, right? So if it's um, a web designer, obviously, do they have, is this what they do all the time? Do they have a specific set of skill sets that I don't have, right? Do they know, you know, more code than I do? Do they have a specific design background? Like, what is it, you know, that makes them different or better than me, right? For me to bring them on, um, to pay them, all that good stuff. Also thinking about are they as passionate as I am about the business, about the topic, about the project, right? Because if you're not on the same wavelength in terms of passion and they're not passionate about the industry or, or the client or, you know, whatever it is that you're working for, there is going to be a very, very obvious disconnect. 
um, in the conversations that you have and just the morale of the team. And then the other thing we want to um, look for is do you guys vibe just on a personal level? Because I totally believe in being able to be friends with who you work with. Obviously, you know, you're not going to be BFFs with everyone, right? Like, that's obviously impossible. But I definitely do think that you can build bonds beyond just the surface with every single person that you work with. So those are kind of the three things that I'm always looking for when building a team. And I found that every single job that I've had or client that I've worked with, that's what made all the difference in a successful project versus one that's not successful. When people come to you for your services or, or, or when you observe people, what mistakes do you think people make when they're doing self-branding? Oh, gosh. What mistakes don't they make is a better question. <laughs> um, I, think it, I really think, honestly, it's all about that confidence piece, right? A lot of times, most of the people that I work with, like I said, they have it all within them, right? Like they know everything that they're – they have their, you know, life together. They know what it is that they want to do, but they're just kind of afraid to say it out loud or they feel like they just don't know what the next step is and they need somebody to reassure them. So a lot of times I'm doing less branding and more coaching because people really do know what their passion is, right? But sometimes they're just like, oh, like, well, that's just too far fetched. Like, I don't think that, you know, that's realistic. Oh, I'm too young. I need to get another degree. I need to do this. I need to do that. Um, And really, when you think about it, if you think about, obviously, you know, like the CEO of Facebook and Malala and all these super young professionals who are doing great things in the world, age and experience didn't stop them, right? They wanted to do something and and they went out and got it done. Um, And I think that we are in an age where a lot of times we second guess ourselves because we feel like, oh, we're too young or we don't have the amount of degrees or experience or credentials that we need, when a lot of times, you know, it's just common sense type of stuff. So the biggest mistake that I see is that just people second guessing themselves and thinking that they need more than what they already have to get started and just being unorganized, right? So a lot of times what kind of pisses me off is I'll teach a workshop, right? Or I'll like group theme engagement and there's a huge line of all these women who are asking me all these questions and you know, I'll give them like a step by step. Well you're gonna you're gonna start blogging or you know, you're gonna do this to your LinkedIn profile or you're gonna do that. And then two months later, I'll shoot them an email like, hey, just wanted to follow up, like how's everything going? And nothing was done, right? So a lot of times the reason why you don't move forward is because you're not willing to put in the work. And if you want different results, you need to take different steps, right? So a lot of times it's also just people being lazy and they don't want to leave, you know, work to write, you know, a blog post or they don't want to spend an hour on a Twitter chat or they don't feel like going to that networking event afterwards because they're tired or they'd rather go to happy hour with their friends. So a lot of times people put themselves in certain, certain predicaments because they're not willing to put in the work. So like I said, it's not really so much about branding per se, the mistakes, but it's more so about lifestyle and mindset that I find the most common. Is it laziness or is it fear? Because sometimes I notice that with people where sometimes people are afraid to say to themselves, listen, I'm scared, I don't know what I'm doing, or I don't want to ask for help. So it could be laziness. But sometimes I see fear in front of people, but they won't admit that they're scared. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think so, too. Um, fear definitely plays a big part of it, but definitely after you take a step forward, right, like I've seen a lot of people, you know, start building out websites or, or start, you know, pitching to these speaking engagements and things like that, then it becomes, you know, life happens and, and just life gets in the way, right? So it is definitely a mix of both. It's fear of the unknown and not knowing, you know, what the next steps are or what's going to come with it. But then sometimes it's just allowing yourself to get distracted with everything else that's happening in your life and not really pushing forward and being as focused as you need to be to build a brand. Because building a brand is honestly another full-time job in and of itself, and you need to prioritize it in the same way that you prioritize other things in your life. So I was scrolling through your tweets, and you said you love Regina TV. And I didn't know much about her. I checked out her stuff. Oh it was, like, God. really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can hit it again. Like, but what is it about Regina TV that inspires you? So I came across Regina, like, legit maybe two weeks ago, and I think that's, like, a stretch. It might have been exactly a week ago. And what I love about Regina is she's only been doing it for about a year and change. She's an infopreneur. So what that means is she charges people – basically to share knowledge about how to build your brand, specifically your blog um, and selling digital products, right? So her business model is all about, you know, selling webinars and eBooks and um, online classes to educate you on building your brand and exposure um, through your website and through the digital space. 
And I'm legit obsessed with her because she's super personable. Like, I feel she is my best friend. She's from Austin, Texas, and I feel like one day I'm just going to show up in Austin and knock on her door, and she will welcome me with open arms, <laughs> never having met me before. Um, she's definitely very, very transparent and genuine. So I did a webinar, and she was great at answering people's questions as they came in. Oftentimes, um, as entrepreneurs or as educators, we want to kind of like get our message across and then do Q&A at the end. But she had no problem like stopping in the middle of it um, to answer everyone's questions and really just built a, a community kind of feel during the webinar that I've never experienced anywhere else. So I think she definitely has a grasp in creating communities and building relationships online in a very, very relatable, down-to-earth kind of way. So I definitely love her because her content is not only valuable, but also the experience of her brand is one that makes you want to keep coming back. I think I go on her website at least like once a week, maybe probably, that's a stretch, probably once a day, really. I like to read her blog all the time. Just because the information is amazing, um, it's so clear and so concise. And like I said, she's just an awesome person. I did a Periscope, uh, and I was talking about, you know, why I rebranded my website and w the things you should think about when you rebrand. And she joined the Periscope, and I literally lost it. I'm like, oh, my God. Hi, Regina. I'm like your biggest fan. I probably look like such a loser. Um, but it was, it was just really awesome because I think she's uh, a woman that's on top of her game, super, super focused. Um, and it's just like doing the things that a lot of us entrepreneurs want to do. So, yeah, kudos to her. <laughs> That's interesting because uh, you had put out a tweet. Um, I think you put like race and ethnicity for yourself, and you said um, Dominican, Puerto Rican with a dash of Beyonce. It's like, oh, okay. Uh -huh. But I guess you need to put uh, Dominican, Puerto Rican with a dash of Beyonce and Regina TV. <laughs> for sure, for sure. I I think that Beyonce is a perfect example of you know another woman that I I admire and I talk about all the time because I've seen like every single documentary that Beyonce has ever put out, every single, um, you know, recording of her concerts and how she prepares for her concerts. And she'll go days without sleeping because she feels like lighting is off for one particular set of her, of her show. Or, you know, she'll spend hours on getting a, a step right, you know. And I think that that kind of work ethic is really what sets you apart when you're trying to succeed, right? There's that quote that, hard work trumps talent when talent doesn't work hard, and I totally, totally agree. You can be the most talented, smartest person in the world, but if you're not working as hard as the next person, you're always going to be one step behind. So, yeah, Regina and Beyonce are definitely two people that I think work their asses off, and the more that, you know, the harder that we work and the more work that we put in, the better off that we'll be. So, for sure. Right. And hey, branding <laughs> isn't just about the digital, the digital is fantastic. I mean, it's great that we have these tools nowadays. But I, I see this too for people, like they're really good online. But when it comes to offline, they're horrible networkers. They, they're not really good at talking to people. I mean, I, you mm -hmm. know, I, I mean, I, I think I put myself in that category from time to time. But yeah, so you might be fantastic online, but eventually you've got to sit down and talk to a person. So mm -hmm. what do you tell people who are very confident online, but offline they're a little bit laid back? Yeah, so I definitely had this problem as well. I was always very self-conscious when I networked because I have an accent, right? I have a Spanish accent and I have a New York Bronx accent. So a lot of times people would not understand what the heck I was saying. So I would find myself constantly repeating myself, and it made me very, very self-conscious to the point that I didn't even want to speak at all. I was a person who would go to a networking event and, like, stand in the corner and just pray that, like, people left their business cards on the table so I can grab them and shoot them an email. It was just the most awkward thing ever. And I also found that I never really knew what to say, right? I never really knew how to introduce myself or how to kind of, you know, keep the conversation going. So I really spent a lot of time, one, learning to speak slower, um, so I wasn't as self-conscious anymore. And I don't think I've mastered that just yet, but definitely working on it. And the other thing was nailing down my elevator pitch, because once I nailed down my elevator pitch, it became so much easier for me to introduce myself, to make connections, and for people to quickly see the value that I would be able to add to them, whether it was, you know, on a personal level or on a professional level. When people are clear on what it is that you do, it opens up the conversation for lots of other things, right? So when people understand that I help, you know, young professionals become more attractive in the marketplace or the job market, then, you know, they're like, oh, okay, like, do you have any tips or, you know, who have you worked with or, you know, 
anything, really. They ask me a ton of different questions, and it kind of keeps the conversation going. And I've also learned to ask a lot of questions, too, um, that don't have anything to do with, you know, a professional life. It's more so, you know, so, like, what do you do for fun? What brings you, you know, what brought you to this networking event? Who do you know here? So I kind of have a, a prepared list of questions, if you will, or kind of, like, prompts to keep the conversation going. And I found that, that that's been helpful, just kind of practicing what it is that I'm going to say and what are the topics that I want to touch on or, or talk about during an event really help me keep the conversation going, whether it's a lunch meeting, a networking event, um, or, you know, I just meet, that happens to meet somebody randomly on the train. Um, it's all about learning to be a good conversationalist uh, and get others to talk about themselves. So what's been a good elevator pitch? Because I heard 30 seconds, 60 seconds, but, you know, when, when you're meeting someone, what do you expect out of a person when, when you first connect with somebody? Okay, so my number one rule is do not tell me your job title. Your job title does not tell me absolute crap about what it is that you do, right? So my best friend happens to be um, a project manager at J.P. Morgan Chase. That, to me, means absolutely nothing, right? I don't know what, you know, he does that on a day-to-day basis. I don't know what skills that he uses. I don't know what division of the bank he works for. It's really, really, really vague. And I find that a lot of industries, especially, you know, like financial services and consulting, healthcare, um, kind of those, like, general corporate industry, there's a lot of ambiguity around job titles. So when you tell me, like, oh, I'm a blah, blah, blah at such and such company, it doesn't really, like I said, open it up for me to ask you questions because I don't really know what it is that you do. So the first thing I always say is figure out how to describe your skill set, right? So for me, as an example, I, I wouldn't say, oh, I'm a marketing manager. I would say I manage social media and create content for a startup in New York City, right? Because that gives you a clear definition of what it is that I as a marketing manager do. Because we also forget that titles across jobs, across companies and industries don't mean the same thing. So you have to put it into context in a way that someone who doesn't work at your particular company or in your particular industry can understand. The next thing is telling me what it is that you're able to help me with, right? So usually when you're networking, you want something out of it, right? You want a connection. You want lunch meeting. You may want to tap on that person for a referral in the future. You may want them to be a client. So you have to tell me explicitly what it is that you want um, because people cannot help you if they don't know what you need help with. So you want to tell them, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I work with young professionals and I'm looking to, you know, get more clients in this area. Or, you know, I'm hoping to finish writing my ebook and start teaching more workshops or get more speaking engagements, whatever it is. So being open and honest about the things that you want are also important in an elevator pitch because you just want to get that out, you know, right up front. And then the last thing is also talking about what it is um, that you do for others and and you're hoping to gain. So for me, because I work with young professionals, what I really want to help people do is land their dream job. So by me telling people, you know, I work with young professionals um, in this space and blah, 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 and I really want to help people land their dream job through my webinars, workbooks, classes, whatever it is, then people are able to, you know, connect the dots. And then, like I said, the conversation can continue. So it's always about making it as clear as possible what it is that you do, how it is that you add value, and what exactly you want to get out of this conversation so that then you can move forward in just, you know, a general connection. So I've never been to New York City before, so uh, which shame on me. So if, if I'm <laughs> in New York, if I'm in New York, what places are good to, good to eat? Oh, my gosh. What places are not good to eat is also a better question. Um, New York is amazing because we have everything here, right? We have Chinatown. We have Little Italy. We have Harlem. We have Spanish Harlem. We have Washington Heights. I mean, every little pocket of the city has, you know, its nuances in terms of cuisines and activities and things to do. I really like Uptown, so I go to, I really like this Cuban place called Havana Cafe, um, which is actually in the Bronx. Um, I love, you know, the typical, like, cafeteria, which is more like American food. Um, there are tons and tons of places, honestly, uh, that I can tell you about, but it depends. What kind of food would you be looking for? See, I don't know. I, I'm more of a meat and potatoes type guy, but it would be a shame for me <laughs> just to eat steak and burgers because I'm in New York and there's so many different things. So I guess if I want to be adventurous, I probably would try 
some Cuban food or some Dominican food just to kind of see what it is. Look, authentic. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think we get too much authentic stuff either. <laughs> but from there, I want yeah. that authentic, yeah, 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 um, uh, authentic Cuban or, or Dominican food or Puerto Rican. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or even you can go down to, like, Chinatown and get the best dumplings, like five dumplings for a dollar. And then actual, like, Vietnamese or, you know, Japanese person will make them. It's amazing. Um, so you definitely will get all that authenticity that you desire from all the cuisines here in New York City, for sure. And currently, what apps and uh, gadgets do you like? I have so many apps. I literally can't take pictures on my phone anymore because I have so many apps. So my number one right now has to be Periscope. I think everyone is obsessed with Periscope. It's really changed the way that you're able to build relationships with your online community. Um, Just the value of people being able to connect a voice to the face and, you know, facial expressions and mannerisms to the tweets and the blog posts that they read um, is definitely changing the game. So Periscope is is definitely my number one right now. I also love Facetune, and Facetune is basically like Photoshop for your pictures. So if you have like, you know, a little wrinkle here, a little pimple there, um, Facetune is awesome to get rid of those. So when you see a lot of people who on Facebook and Instagram pictures are like flawless, it's because Facetune probably was in the mix in there somewhere. I also really, really like Snapchat, obviously, Instagram, like those traditional kinds of um, social media apps. But my favorite, favorite one to kind of automate a lot of processes is it's called IF, I-F. Um, I can't think of the full name, but the icon is a little blue icon with I-F in white. And what that allows me to do is an extension of a platform called If This Then That. And I'm able to automate a ton of different things. So, for example, anytime someone posts a picture on Instagram with the hashtag, the branding you, I automatically get a notification on my phone. So that way I can go and engage with them right away and continue the conversation going. In the morning at 8 o'clock every day, I get a notification of what the weather is going to be like for that day. You know, if I save a picture in a particular Dropbox folder, it also automatically gets saved into my iPhone photo stream. So if, for example, I created a graphic on my computer, instead of having to email it to myself and save it, I can just drop it in there and using that recipe, it will automatically be on my phone ready to share on social. So that is definitely the number one app that I use in terms of automation and kind of connecting all my tools together because it really allows me to save a ton and ton of time on doing little tedious tasks um, that I would normally have to spend, you know, an hour or two doing every single day. All of these different recipes automate it for me, and they get done for me at the time that I set. So that's definitely a good one to look into, and you can connect it to tons of different things from your Fitbit to, you know, your um, Spotify. I mean, there are tons of integrations that um, it has, so you can use it, you know, as you see fit. All right, Emily De La Cruz, thank you for the conversation. If people want to check you out, where can they go? They can find me on Insta, Twitter, and Periscope under Emily De La Cruz, and, of course, my website, thebrandingnews.com, where I have tons of free resources, worksheets, uh, and guides on personal branding as well as social media and the job search. All right. Oh, yeah, and one last thing. So my beloved Cavs lost to the Warriors uh, a few months ago. Yeah, it sucks. But so you wrote an interesting, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you wrote an interesting piece where you said, I'm not really a big sports fan, but you wrote an interesting piece where you talked about the Cavs and the Warriors and data and teamwork, especially, and you focus on Tristan Thompson. Most people probably will focus on LeBron, but you focus on Tristan Thompson talking about what he does as a player wrapped around teamwork and data. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I am forced and coerced into watching sports. Like, I'm not such a big sports fan, honestly, um, but I come from a huge, huge sports family, like, to the point where every Sunday my grandma takes out, like, a Giants jersey and people paint their faces and we sit in my living room and watch football. It's bizarre. Um, but every single <laughs> day it's, like, a, you know, a thing. So during basketball season, I found myself watching a ton and ton of basketball, and I was kind of like, okay, how can this be useful to me in my life? And I kind of saw how, you know, the players all play a very, very specific role in making, you know, the team successful at different points throughout the series, and I wanted to just kind of highlight that um, in a way where people who aren't always into data can digest it in a way because they understand basketball. And then people who are, you know, don't really, aren't really sports fans can still understand the concept of teamwork and working together and playing your role and understanding, okay, I wasn't brought onto the team 
to shoot, I was brought onto the team, you know, to provide assists. Or I was, you know, brought for defense or whatever it is, you know, and understanding when you play your role properly within your team dynamic, it just allows you to become that much better because everyone's clear on what the plan is. Like, not everyone can be the superstar at the same time. I definitely found that super, duper interesting when I was watching it and, you know, re- reading all the recaps on ESPN and things. And I'm like, let me do a post. Why not? Why not make this useful for me? And it turned out to be a pretty successful post. So I was proud that my little bit of basketball knowledge got me far. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't like sports too much, what do you like watching? I don't know. I like watching kinds of shows like Power, Empire, like those kinds of things. I do dabble a little bit in the ratchet reality TV. So I do watch Love and Hip Hop. I'm so ashamed to say. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, do that really. I'm more of a of a reader. Uh, so usually throughout the week I'm like diving into different blogs and things like that just because I always have to create new content for my site. Um, but when I do get a chance to, you know, jump on Netflix and watch, you know, like Orange is the New Black or like I said, Empire or Power, those kinds of dramas, you know, I definitely binge watch as much as I can. And what are you reading now? I'm actually reading a book called The Indigest Success, which is by Lisandra Vega, and she's a Latina who wrote this book around executive presence and how, as women, we need to be mindful of three things. We need to be mindful of, obviously, our appearance or how we dress, our dressing to kind of convey confidence and convey credibility, our communication, so how do we speak, you know, how do we um, interact with people, are we charming, are we funny, are we building relationships quickly, right? And then the last thing is gravitas, which focuses just specifically on that charm piece, right? Because when someone's credible, they're also usually very charismatic. Some of the best leaders, you know, that we've seen in our time are very, very charismatic leaders, are people that you learn to love and respect, and how we need to take those same exact personas and habits into the workplace in order for us to be successful. So it's a super, super good book um, on executive presence. I'm always all about that self-help type of stuff. So I definitely recommend that they check it out. All right. I'll check that out as well. Thanks a lot, Emily. No problem. Thank you, and I appreciate us being able to finally catch up after weeks and weeks. I promise I'm not as busy as I sound. <laughs> it's hard to believe because, you're, I mean, you're so prolific <laughs> putting out stuff. It's like, wow. Like, yeah, the, the last question, this is truly the last question. You're so tied <laughs> to technology and branding. Like, what do, you, do you ever have, like, a non-digital, non-tech day where you just say, okay, no, no gadgets, no Twittering, no Snapchatting, nothing, I, no periscoping, I, it's just me <laughs> and the space. Do you ever have like a non tech day? Um, I think that that's actually impossible. Um, I have not, I cannot remember the last time that I went a whole day without doing something on social media, whether it was automated or live, right? So, you know, on the weekends, I'm not always tweeting. Some of my tweets, like the articles that I put out, I read during the week, and I've just scheduled them out, like, for a later date. So I'm usually always, always on social in some aspect, but I'm actually about to go to Dubai. So I'm going to be on a plane for like 15 hours. So I think that's going to be my digital detox, if you will, because I'm not going to have service and I'm definitely not going to pay for Wi-Fi. So, I mean, we'll see how those 15 hours of nothing go um, while I'm on my trip. So wish me luck. Yeah, I would love to see a live feed to see you go through your thralls from gadgets. <laughs> oh, that would be so nice. <laughs> I'll, just be, I'll just probably be like clicking in and out of apps, like just randomly reading like old tweets or something trying to get you know connected because it's honestly a habit like the first thing that I do when I get on the train is I sit down and like I open up you know my Twitter or open up Instagram and stuff like that and because I'm a marketing manager as well I'm you know I manage social media so I'm on Twitter and Instagram every single day all day so it's just like my world if you will but I definitely do try to just connect you know and hang out with people in real life, if you will. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely hard when, you know, your whole life is kind of so tied to technology to see your life without it. Well, have a safe trip to Dubai. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I will be posting all my pictures on Insta. Uh, I feel like I got Wi-Fi, so I'm sure that digital detox will be short-lived. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot, Emily. <laughs> no problem. Have a good night. Bye-bye. I want to thank Emily De La Cruz for being a great guest on The Digital Life. Make sure you check her out at TheBrandingMuse.com. That's TheBrandingMuse.com. And be sure to check out my new ebook, So You Think You Know Content Marketing, now available on Amazon. 
Before I go, I have a Twitter question for you. Tweet me at Kevin Lockett and tell me the best branding advice you ever heard or given. Use the hashtag Digital Kev. That's the hashtag Digital Kev. And give me the best branding advice you ever given or received. And we end today's show for Digital Life Spotlight, this time featuring Akron's own Red Rose Panic with the song Ashley and Alexis. You know, these guys are cool. The song is cool. So I hope they blow up because I think they deserve it. So sit back and relax and enjoy the cool vibes of Red Rose Panic. All right, everybody. It's the Digital Life. I'm Kevin Lockett. And I'm out. That's cool. Well, I'm on my day when it's dark at night. A two you and your view from your office light. A blue hues mark the few that be talking right. I'm so confused when she moves so I'm often like I'm asleep. And I used to dream of Ashley. Uh, no, she ain't mine. And baby, all we need is time. Or come and see me in the evening time. Oh, you gon' fall if you wanna. Escape and fall for the winner. Yeah, I'm straight falling for the winner. Huh, for all those who consider. Yeah, all these pretty ass misses. Uh, ain't got nothing on you. Nothing on you, girl. 